I'm Greg Benfield. This is the first part of a two-part audiovisual introduction to the topic evaluation, more specifically educational evaluation. I recommend that if you read nothing else, you at least read two things, the Graham Gibbs paper called Dimensions of Quality and the Hounsell book chapter Evaluating Courses and Teaching. Before we narrow down on the topic evaluating the effectiveness of our teaching, let's clarify some terms and lay out some general principles. Broadly speaking then, what do I mean educational evaluation? Evaluation generally involves learning about a program or course by gathering information about its effectiveness or quality. And that information gathering should be related to decision making. In other words, with educational evaluation, we're usually concerned with systematically attempting to find out whether and how well some educational process is doing its job and how it should be improved or modified. Educational process here encompasses a very broad range of possibilities, including course design, a teaching or a learning technique, an assessment method or an educational device like a piece of technology or an assessment tool like a new quiz or assignment. You'll notice that I'm not including in this definition of evaluation things like making judgments about student learning. In the UK we refer to this type of evaluation as assessment or student assessment. The slide you're looking at now is intended to give you just a sense of the potential breadth of educational evaluation. Trying to evaluate a course could well include several of the categories listed on this slide. For example, the effectiveness of a course is very likely to be influenced by resources like those you see in the top left hand side of the slide. Things like the research interests and expertise of the teaching staff the cost of providing teaching rooms and resources, and the methods and effectiveness of supporting students outside as well as inside of class. Equally important, especially from the student experience perspective, are things like those appearing on the bottom right hand side of the slide, like whether or how well the course attends to student needs, the clarity and currency of the course's intended learning outcomes, and the assessment strategies that are used to support and monitor student learning. Now as I've been talking some of you may have been rightly asking what does he mean effectiveness? Evaluation necessarily involves notions of quality standards. In education there are myriad such measures of quality. Graham Gibbs's paper examines some of these common measures of quality by classifying them according to Biggs's three P's. Pressage, or the things that are in place before students start learning. Process, the things that affect student learning as it's happening. And product, or the outcomes of the learning. This slide mentions just a few of the common measures of quality used in each category. The Gibbs paper explains these in more detail. I've chosen this quote by Graham Gibbs as an example of one of the complexities, the difficulties of carrying out educational evaluation. These four criteria that Gibbs refers to, class size, student effort, who teaches, and quantity and quality of feedback, are according to Gibbs the best predictors of student gain through engagement with their course. What Gibbs is concerned about with these four indicators of quality in the UK anyway is that our commonly used quality assurance processes don't normally gather good data about them. Likewise, although instruments like the National Student Survey in the UK and the Course Experience Questionnaire in Australia purport to seek information about some of these things, in reality they shed little light on those four criteria because what they measure is perceptions of student satisfaction. They don't measure engagement in the learning process or the value added students obtain from the resources they use at university. So one of the chief evaluation design issues concerns sources of evidence. 
We'll come back to this idea again in the next section, but for now I just want to remind you of Brookfield's four critically reflective lenses, an idea you met in the first session. Almost all reflective practice will involve the first lens, or source of evidence, one's own experiences. But what Brookfield's four lenses emphasize is the need to seek confirmations of one's own perceptions from a range of other sources. In general, I think we can say that good reflective practice or educational evaluation should involve using at least three of these four lenses and preferably all four. Because educational variables are many and they interact with each other in complex ways, usually we seek multiple sources of evidence. To give an example, student feedback in an end of module evaluation might suggest there's a problem with one of their assignments having been invalid, that is not assessing the intended learning outcomes as it was intended to, or maybe it required more of them than was justified at their current level. We're more likely to have confidence in such an inference if, in addition to this student feedback, the grades on the assignment were abnormally low. And we're going to have even more confidence in such an inference if colleagues who had previously taught the topics involved, or the external examiner perhaps, also thought the assignment was too hard. It's hard to overestimate the importance of using theory in educational evaluation. One thing that theory does is clarify, both for the evaluator and their intended audience, what is meant by quality in the given context. If, for example, we're trying to decide the effectiveness of some learning activities that are being designed within a course, then explicitly adopting a particular learning theory, such as constructivism or experiential learning, each of which has well-known and understood features, allows the evaluator to test whether these features are present in practice. To take another example, one might use the well-known course design framework of constructive alignment as an evaluative principle. You might ask questions like how well aligned are the learning outcomes and assessments in the course, or how well aligned are learning activities and assessments, and so on. There are quite a lot of frameworks or sets of principles of good practice in learning and teaching out there in the literature. If you can find one that's particularly suitable for your teaching context and that accords well with the values and principles you adhere to, then it's to your advantage to use it as a theoretical underpinning to your evaluation. It will help you to interrogate the practice you are examining and perhaps as importantly, it will help you to communicate your analytical approach and your findings and conclusions to your intended audience.